from CBS Sports. High drive, center field, at the wall, Magnificent. Got a fantasy question? Email fantasy baseball at cbsi.com. Get ready to win your league. Where fantasy becomes reality. Now, here's Frank, Scott, Chris, and Adam. What's up, everybody? Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Monday, May 10th. Happy belated Mother's Day to all the great moms out there. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Another week goes by, another no-hitter. This time, wait, Miley? Really? Okay. We have lots of pitchers to be worried about. We'll talk about all of them. We got some waiver wire ads, some trade candidates, and more. Scott, what is up, man? How was your weekend? Was it closer to Wade Miley or Luis Castillo? Hmm. And and <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that question in terms of how their weekends were, I guess. Uh, it was good. It, I guess it was closer to Wade Miley, though that's probably overstating it a bit. Got to celebrate the mothers in my life, my wife, which include my own mother and my wife and my mother-in-law. I guess my sister-in-law, too. She was around and his mother. So, yeah, good weekend. <laughs> Nice. What's up, Chris? You got the flashy jacket on. I do have the flashy jacket on. It's a special day. What what day is it? Just because I'm wearing the jacket and also it's Mother's Day. Well, no, not anymore. It's not Mother's Day anymore. Sorry, moms. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I only uh, get the one day. <laughs> I did. No, I did. Uh, my mom and sister were in town. It's the first time I've seen them since the start of the pandemic. So that was very nice. Oh, we nice. had brunch on a boat. My wife got seasick. Okay, well, uh, and we, not nice, but... And we went to multiple m- museums. So it was a nice weekend. Awesome. All righty. Well, let's get back into fantasy baseball before people start yelling at us. Oh, my good, goodness gracious. All right. Let's start with the no hitter. Scott, your oh, my goodness gracious player from the weekend. Wade Miley. Let's talk about it, man. Eight strikeouts, to just one walk. ERA is down to 2.00 with a 0.75 whip. Wade Miley is 59% rostered. Is he a must add starting pitcher? I, I I like how you just revealed my oh my goodness great you didn't yeah, save sorry. the reveal for me which is really the only point of having us each pick one but that's fine uh, is he must add Wade Miley no and I think the fact that he's still available in forty one percent of leagues shows that people recognize this about Wade Miley and I'm proud of them I'm proud of the CBS Sports users for resisting this long first of all with that ERA. And second, you know, the fact he has four wins too. And second of all, uh, not treating the no hitter as the impetus to add him because he's still Wade Miley and he's 34 years old and we know exactly who he is. And he's always been this fringy streamer type who probably going to have a pretty good ERA just because he's so good at putting the ball on the ground and in an era when some much offense is generated by home runs being hit. That's that's a good way to reduce damage. But two of the past three years, a good ARA for Miley. And even so, he wasn't pitching deep into games, minimal strikeout rate. It's a pretty hollow ERA. Even as good as he's been this, this year, this no-hitter was only his third quality start, which tells you even the Reds don't really want him going more than five innings. I think he's a usable pitcher. I think you'll want him for the right two start weeks with the right matchups, but otherwise you're just not going to be that motivated to get him in your lineup. And of course the ERA is going to go up from here. It's not, he's not going to finish with the two ERA. I promise you this week. Wade Miley is slated to face the Rockies at Coors field. So that's another reason why you would be skeptical, at least about using him this week. Looks like he's lined up to face the giants after that. I agree. I don't think he's a must add maybe in some category leagues, some deeper leagues. Sure. Get him on your team. Uh, he's doing things a little bit different this year, throwing his change up a little bit more career high 32% of the time. You mentioned he gets a lot of ground balls, so it helps minimize some damage, uh, especially pitching in great American ballpark, but great start for Wade Miley. Can't take anything away from him. Fifth, no hitter so far this season. It's crazy. Well, that's that's well fifth. And that's if you're, that's if you're counting bum garners, seven inning, no hitter, which yeah, it's, like, it's like four and a half. Would do, I guess we as a, a show four and are seven nights. counting it. Yeah. yeah. That's um, it. No, and, and we're we're not even six weeks into the season, and there have already been four slash five no hitters. So it's quite the run we're on. Oh. They they I think what we saw 
on Friday is an unremarkable pitcher to do something that's increasingly unremarkable. That's fair. And it's, and especially against an unremarkable lineup too at that Cleveland is one of the teams that has been no hit twice already this season. Of course, Carlos Jordan earlier in the season and now Wade Miley as well. Chris, how about you? Oh my goodness gracious from the weekend. Yeah. And I just want to point out like league wide batting average is 234. That's actually up a little bit, but it is the lowest of all time uh, in major league history. The second lowest in 1968 famously known as the year of the pitcher. It was 237. Other than that, there's never been a season below 242. Uh, so yeah, we're at a point where we're 10 points lower than the second lowest season of all, or the third lowest season of all time. And the only other season uh, within that group led to one of the biggest uh, rule changes of the last 50 years in lowering the mound. So no hitters will probably be more uh, prevalent this season, you would think at least, than ever before. That's just how that would seem to work out. Um, Back in my day, Chris, you would and, get and, maybe two, <laughs> one or two no hitters in one season. And this is the kind of a sort of natural, uh, you know, we started worrying about this kind of offensive season after uh, you know, it was revealed that the new ball in spring training when they were using it was making it harder to hit home runs, even though velocity was exit velocity was increasing. Balls weren't traveling as far. If you have more strikeouts and we do every single year at some point, maybe that will stop and you have fewer home runs. This is the inevitable outcome. And um, I can't wait to see what Major League Baseball does with the ball next year. Um. My own, oh my goodness gracious player, Max Scherzer. What a start. 14 strikeouts. I believe this is his 100th start with at least 10 strikeouts, which was, you know, the something th most of all time, or he became the something th player to do that. I'm not sure what it was. Maybe seven, maybe 12, uh, maybe 15, two. Um, he's awesome, man. He's still really, really good. Uh, he's, not quite the pitcher he used to be. His velocity is down a mile per hour on his fastball on average uh, from last season. But but, that, but on average isn't even really the fairest way to judge it because he had like those three starts where it dropped like three miles per hour from where we're used to seeing him. It's, it's basically yeah. been back the past two or three starts. Yeah, you can't really like, but also you can't tell. <laughs> You know, yeah, like no, he's still getting yeah. a ton of whiffs. His strikeout rate right. is actually a career high, 35.5%. His walk rate is the second lowest of his career. His ERA is 233. His XERA is 289. His XERA in 2019, 283. So, yeah, yeah he, he looks... Obviously, there's injury risk with a guy his age, um, but he looks just about as good as he ever has right now. Yeah, and it's not crazy either. We just saw Justin Verlander a couple of years ago mm -hmm. be amazing at, at that advanced age. So, yeah, everything under the hood for me when I, when I looked into Scherzer today was he looks perfectly fine. So uh, I was a little bit worried about the injuries, the walks going up the past couple of years, the hard contact. That is not an issue with me anymore. He is, I mean, I got to move him up. He probably deserves to be a top five, six, eight starting pitcher. Definitely Still higher four for me. Darvish yep. and Bauer are up in that range. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, solid uh, solid top six. I mean, I, I think Nola and Giolito have moved themselves slightly down from that group. Yep, I think that would make sense. And then you also have Glass now and Corbin Burns that are just behind that group as well. But that's your top 10, top 12-ish starting pitchers so far this season. I want to talk about the pitcher that opposed Wade Miley on Friday and Zach Plesak, who... He's kind of been polarizing so far this season, uh, and he was great. And that started just, it's tough luck, uh, tough luck. Well, he didn't get the loss, but it was just a tough luck game for him. Overall, eight shutout innings against the Cincinnati Reds in that game. Three hits, zero walks, seven strikeouts. The last three starts for Zach Plesak. 1.27 ERA, 0 0.75 whip with a 12.4% swinging strike rate. And the fastball velocity has been up over 94 miles per hour in each of those starts. Last season, when he was great, he averaged 92.8 miles per hour on his fastball. So I do think there are more strikeouts coming his way. Velocity up. 
I really like what I've seen. I, do you guys trust what we're seeing from Police Act these last three starts? Or would you use this as an opportunity to sell high on him while you can? I mean, uh, go first. Uh, I have a feeling we're going to get differing opinions. <laughs> I don't think we will because like, yeah, his last three starts have been pretty good, but there's like a three run start in there. There's a four walk start in there. Like, I don't like, I think he's a slightly above average pitcher who is more likely than your average pitcher to pitch deep into games and probably slightly more likely to get wins than your average pitcher. I would feel better about that on a different team, but like, I, I think him and Aaron Savale are kind of the Spider-Man meme. You know, they're, they're kind of both the same guy. Um, I think we're not particularly excited about either of them, but you know, I, I have a clear idea who Savale is. I mean, <laughs> everything about Plesak has, has been so confound. Like, his usage has been all over the place this season, and it was very different the past two years, too. His strikeout rate is way down this year, yet his ground ball rate is way up. And, like, for a while, you could have said, oh, with that ground ball rate being so high, he's had some bad home run luck. But remember, what, it seemed like he was giving up three home runs a game suddenly he's at less than a less than a home run per nine like what happened there so i don't know i i feel like he's I, it's pretty clear he's not the guy he was last year i think you know he's tough to figure out on a granular level like i just tried to do but the sum of it equals kind of what chris was saying kind of joining Aaron Savale in that middle class of starting pitchers. Both guys are going to generally work deep into games, have a good chance of winning games, but because they're vulnerable to contact, they're going to get blown out sometimes. You just yeah, got to I mean, live with that. Yeah, you know, he's got a 3-4-1 ERA and a 4-2-5 FIP in 211 innings in his major league career. I think somewhere in between those two numbers is probably what he is. A high 3 ERA, basically. Yeah, like 3-7, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's not a stud. pitcher. If you're it's going, not an ace, but it's pretty good. If you're averaging more than six innings a start, I mean, yeah, you'll definitely take that. Yeah. Would you trade Zach Plesak for, we're going to talk about him much more in depth uh, in just a little bit, but would you trade Plesak for Luis Castillo? If you can, every, it? every single day, nine days a week, 425 days out of the year. There is no question in my mind that Luis Castillo is a better pitcher than Zach Plesak. Moving forward, right now, in perpetuity for the remainder of human existence. <laughs> All right. So if you can make that happen, go out and do it. Before we get to news and notes, I want to let you know about the all-new Stitcher podcast app. It's been rebuilt from the ground up to make it easier to listen to podcasts on the go or on the revamped web player. Stitcher is, your ho is home to all your favorite podcasts from classics like My Favorite Murder, this American Life, and How Did This Get Made? All the CBS show, shows as well, such as Pick 6, the Fantasy Football Today podcast, and of course, Fantasy Baseball Today and FBT and 5. In Stitcher, you have more control, like setting your download preferences per show and the ability to listen at virtually any speed. With Stitcher, you can listen to your podcast anytime, anywhere. So give the all-new Stitcher a try. Download it in the App Store or at stitcherapp.com slash download. Jacob DeGrom, left Sunday start early with right side tightness. Though manager Luis Rojas said the injury is closer to DeGrom's lower back than to his lat. So yeah. he's got something going on. It's either his back or his lat or his side. It's just, let's call it his upper body. There's clearly something where Jacob DeGrom is not right. And it seems like they're kind of rushing him back like other teams have done. Um, you know, George Springer, and I brought that up recently, and Juan Soto. So how worried are you guys about this injury with Jacob deGrom lingering? Um, I wouldn't. I think he's going to go on the IL, but I don't think it's going to be a lengthy absence. Um, I, I was encouraged to hear it was a different part of the back, maybe a result of him compensating for the first injury, you know, as opposed to him really tearing that lat. And, you know, his demeanor on the mound when he was pulled didn't look like he had suffered something uh, catastrophic. So I think he's, I think he's, I think they're going to need to give him a couple turns off to heal up and rest up and, and then it'll be fine. Um, 
you know, I get, I guess we'll know for sure when he has the MRI, but that's my thinking right now. Chris, is this enough to drop Jacob DeGrom behind Garrett Cole and Shane Bieber and maybe Max Scherzer? Definitely behind Cole and Bieber. I think he, he should be there. I had him kind of a mini tier of his own. I just think he's that much better than everyone else. But, you know, obviously I'm usually the guy who's downplaying injuries coming into the season or at least injury risk coming into the season. I think on the whole, there there might be a tendency among fantasy players to underrate injuries that are currently present, um, you know, to be overly optimistic about present injuries. And I'm certainly guilty of that myself. Um, I did not think Cattell Marte would be out this long as I go through waivers on every single one of my team and see him in the IL spot. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's probably rest of season. I think it's more likely he's closer to Max Scherzer than Garrett Cole and Shane Bieber. But I think on a perning basis, I would still expect him to be the best pitcher in baseball. It's just now there's an uncertainty, you know, he's better than Shane, than Shane Bieber and Garrett Cole, in my opinion, but those two guys haven't had a start scratched and then been pulled from their most recent start. So I think you have to have him above those guys, but there's nothing actionable there. Like right. You're if right. you could trade him for Shane Bieber right now, if somebody wants to do that trade, yes, you should do that. That seems pretty unlikely. So you kind of just have to wait it out and hope that, you know, he he's okay. And that the Mets aren't metsing this. Corbin Burns will rejoin his teammates on Monday and will throw a bullpen session with an eye towards being activated later in the week. Say by Monday, well, rather Tuesday is when things would lock for the Mets. But if we don't have more information when lineups lock, would you leave Jacob DeGrom and or Corbin, Corbin Burns in your lineups this week? No. <laughs> no, I'm sitting Burns. Yeah, I, I probably would sit both if I could. You know, I have... Most of my teams have enough alternatives of pitching that I could do that. Um, but yeah, I'd be I'd be likely to sit both. We had a few prospect call-ups this weekend. Let's start with Nate Pearson, the top pitching prospect in the Blue Jays organization. Maybe that's becoming arguable with the way that Alec Manoa is pitching in the minors right now. But Nate Pearson lasted only two and a third against the Astros. Obviously, a tough matchup there, too. They throw the guy out his first start of the season against one of the best lineups in the league. Anyway, Nate Pearson, he allowed three runs. He walked five. He's 59% rostered. Scott, is Nate Pearson a must-add? Uh, no. No, not after the way the first start went. And uh, obviously, we saw him make a few starts last year either. And he wasn't good enough to stick on rosters then either. Uh, one thing that may have gotten lost in in the rehabilitation and him returning to the majors is that he kind of changed up his mechanics in the minors in the hopes of avoiding a future injury like he suffered to his groin that caused him to miss time at the start of the season. Um, And he wasn't that efficient in his one minor league start either. So I, I don't know if that mechanical adjustment is having an effect on on everything the way a mechanical adjustment can certainly the stuff still look good but but yeah i think he's i think he's got to do some proving before i'm going to call him must add or must roster or whatever if you can only pick up one pitcher would you rather have nate pearson or wade miley pearson the other prospect that came up this weekend was trevor larnack first round pick for the minnesota twins back in 2018 he batted 309 with 13 homers and an 842 OPS in the minors back in 2019. He is 15% rostered and with Byron Buxton on the IL set to miss at least a few weeks with a grade two hip strain. It seems like Larnack is going to get some playing time. So Chris, uh, where, if anywhere, are would you be looking to add Trevor Larnack? Um, you know, most leagues where, where he's available, I, I think would be, you know, 12 team points leagues, maybe not, but given the injuries that they've got, I think he, you know, has a fair chance to play pretty regularly to start. And, you know, it's a, it's a limited minor league track record, only 20, 172 games, 734 plate appearances, a lot of doubles, not a ton of home runs, but he hit for a good average, walked a lot. You know, he could be, uh, you know, someone who contributes batting average and, you know, some ancillary counting stats, but probably not a stud in any of them. And uh, given the state of outfield, 
you almost certainly have a spot in your outfield in a five team league where you could use five an outfielder outfield league. Five outfielder league, yes. I well, I'm thinking. Yeah. In most of my five outfielder leagues, I've got about four outfield spots that I could use an upgrade on. So <laughs> uh, Larnack would be uh would be someone I would consider adding. Yeah. Scott, you have anything you want to add on Larnack? No, I mean I I don't know that I'd be interested in in him in a three outfielder league just yet, but five outfielder league, uh yeah, somebody in your league could use him, I'm sure. Brian Hayes was transferred to the 60-day IL on Sunday, which means he won't be eligible to return until early June. Colin Moran was placed on the IL with left groin discomfort. Juan Soto will resume full-time duties in right field starting Tuesday. Astros manager Dusty Baker said that Framber Valdez could be available to return from the IL in June. The Blue Jays placed Rafael Dolis on the IL with a calf injury. The assumption... I guess is that got to be Romano now, right? Yeah, it's it's got to be. be right? Jordan yeah, Romano yeah. is forty-seven percent rostered in CBS leagues, though Tyler Chatwood, yes, that Tyler Chatwood has pitched very well out of the bullpen <laughs> for yeah. the Blue Jays. Oh my gosh, that'd be so funny! Oh my god, uh, Scott, <laughs> is uh, is Jordan Romano a must-add in category leagues? I uh, yeah, sure, for now. Until somebody else gets the save. <laughs> That's right. Jazz Chisholm will start a minor league rehab assignment on Tuesday. The Rangers confirmed Willie Calhoun will continue to play every day, even with Chris Davis activated. Alex Cobb was placed on the aisle with a blister on his right middle finger. It's possible that Anthony Rendon will only require a minimum stay on the IL. He's first eligible to return on Friday. Noah Syndergaard is expected to begin a rehab assignment in approximately one week. Mid-June is the expectation for him to return. Alejandro Kirk was transferred to the 60-day IL this weekend, which means we won't see him until July at the earliest. Alberto Mondesi, where's the timetable? We don't have one. He remains without a timetable for a rehab assignment. Alex Kirloff is scheduled to take swings in the next few days. If his wrist responds well, he could be back soon. If it does not, surgery is an option. Aaron Sanchez was placed on the IL with... That's just such extreme alternatives. Yeah, I know. It's... I guess the nature of the the situation right now. It's cross your fingers, gang. Seriously, man, and it, uh, it's just so frustrating because he was playing so well too. So it 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 feels like the we won't have surgery for now thing usually ends up in surgery. I don't know. That's anecdotal, but yeah. you know. Well, I well that I mean just the fact that those are the two choices make it seem like they're going to put off surgery till the end of the season if he can yeah. play through it, right? Which, yeah. you know, considering having followed him as a prospect, he had this monster 2018, 2019 not so good because he was dealing with a wrist issue, right? So is that something you even want him playing through? Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I think even if he's cleared and returns in short order, um, I'm still a little concerned about Kirilov's 2020 outlook. Yeah. 2021 <laughs> outlook. <laughs> I think if I have him on a keeper or dynasty team, yeah, I'd rather the twins just play it as safe as possible with him, right? I mean, we want this guy to be healthy long term. Yeah. Obviously, he could help this year, but uh, why rush it? Aaron Sanchez was placed on the IL with right biceps tightness. Logan Webb, Webb will remain in the rotation for the time being. Francisco Mejia was placed on the IL due to left intercostal discomfort. Yadier Molina was reinstated from the IL on Saturday. TJ Crone is dealing with a back injury that forced him to miss this entire weekend's worth of games. Scott, is Crone too risky to start in weekly leagues? I know you originally had him as a sleeper for this upcoming week. Yeah, I, I took him out of the top 10 sleeper hitters. I just, as a policy, I don't put injured players in the top 10 sleeper hitters because that's just asking for failure. I added Tyler Naquin in his place since the Reds have the best matchups and they're going against all righties. And Naquin, I think, has started seven straight or something like that. Um, Does that mean like a whole week worth of just like pretty good pitchers? Like they're all right or they all throw right handed? They all throw right. Okay. Just just needed to confirm that. They're not all righties. <laughs> yeah. They're all righties, but they're not all righties. Or I mixed up the inflection <laughs> there, but you get the idea. Um, yeah. But oh, Luke Voigt is coming back. So that's. 
I know, I know you can't just replace CJ Crone with Luke Voigt in all likelihood, but if you could, <laughs> that that's a move you could make. Enrique Hernandez was placed on the 10 day IL with a right hamstring strain. Marwin Gonzalez was leading off on Sunday and has 10 hits over his last seven games. He's 11% rostered and pretty much has every position eligibility if you need that in a deeper league. Brian Reynolds is considered day-to-day with lower body soreness. Tony Gonsolin threw a bullpen session on Sunday and is scheduled to pitch in a simulated game later this week. He's still likely two to three weeks away. Rays manager Kevin Cash said that Diego Castillo feels much better and should be on track for a minimal stay on the 10-day IL. Chris Paddock was activated and started on Sunday. He only pitched three innings but they were three shutout with four strikeouts. On the other side, Johnny Cueto was also activated. He allowed five runs over three innings. He has a pretty nice matchup this week up against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Kohei Arihara was placed in the IL. Nico Horner was checked out. Uh, he checked out fine after taking part in light fielding and hitting work over the past few days. He's eligible to return next weekend. Ramon Laureano was out Sunday with a minor thumb issue. Brendan Rodgers will report to the Rockies extended spring training facility in Arizona this week to continue playing in simulated games. And Miguel Andohar was optioned to AAA with Luke Voigt expected back on Tuesday. Gio Urshela missed the entire weekend with a a knee injury, but has not been placed on the IL. We're out on a Monday. A lot of news, man. A lot of news. Uh, Let's start off with Luis Castillo. We already mentioned the name. Definitively better than Zach Plesak. Now, past, present, till the end of time. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about him at Cleveland. The same team that Wade Miley no hit the night before four innings, five hits, six runs, four of those earned two walks, only two strikeouts, three swinging strikes on 84 pitches for Luis Castillo in the start. The ERA now up to 6.42 and the swinging strike rate in particular this season down from 15% last year. It's at 9.7%. Chris, we'll start with you. The worryometer on Luis Castillo. 0.6. I'm not not worried at all, but I'm not particularly worried. Like, That's... I don't feel good. I am not happy that his ERA is 642. Uh, I'm not thrilled that his 465 FIP is not that much better. But like, this isn't even the worst stretch of his career. In 2018, his first seven starts, he had a 7.01 ERA, and then he had another seven stretch later in that season, from the end of May to the end of June, where he had a 6.19 ERA. He had a 5.85 ERA overall through the end of June in that season. He finished the season with a 2.63 ERA over the final three months. Obviously, I am hoping it does not take until July 1st for Luis Castillo to turn things around in 2021, but his velocity not that far off it's not where it was last year but it's not that far off from where it was prior than that his spin rate again not that far off from where it's been his spin axis his release point everything is pretty much at least physically where within the range of where we would expect it to be it's not like you can look at something physically that he's doing and say wow this is where he's gone wrong biggest issue really his fastballs are getting absolutely crushed. His sinker and his four-seamer are getting demolished right now, and they have never been his best pitches. His changeup has been his best pitch. He's not getting as many whiffs on that. That's less concerning for me. I just, the fact that there's no physical explanation for it just leads me to believe that he's not pitching well right now, which is reflected in his ERA and his lack of swinging strikes and every, basically anything you want to throw at. Like, I, I think you kind of look at it like, Okay, his ERA is bad. Let's look under the hood. Okay, his FIP is better, but still bad. Okay, his strikeout rate is low. Okay, well, his changeup whiff rate is low, and that's his primary put on. You add all those things up, and like, there are reasons for why he is not pitching well. But once you get down to the bottom of it, it's mostly just like, uh, he's just not pitching well, which maybe he'll just won't pitch well moving forward. Maybe this will just continue to be an issue. Maybe it's unfixable. But I have no real reason to believe that after you know four, five really good years as a major league pitcher, the most seven recent games are representative of Luis Castillo's skill set. I found some quotes from after his start, and here's what he had to say. What I've seen is about 70% of my pitches are staying in the zone. I'm definitely noticing that, and I'm definitely focused on that too. 
what I'm trying to do now is pitch lower so that so that way we can get more swings and misses and more ground balls, which makes sense because that's who Luis Castillo has always been. He also added, I think we're close. The reason why is we know what's going on and we know what's wrong and we know we can fix it too. I think we're definitely close and we'll be there soon. So Scott, does that inspire any confidence in you when it comes to Luis Castillo? Are you more worried than a 0.6? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I figured. Yeah. Look, I'm not um, not worried at all. I know, but there's there's ten units on the worryometer, and you picked sub the lowest one. So that's no, no. There's a lower uh, I, one. I I would. Um, there's eleven. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna remove the decimal point there and just make it a a solid six for okay. my worry on Luis Castillo. I'm gonna be the wet blanket here, but I mean. Just trying to put myself in the position of the people who are having to manage this right now. I, I have a league, a 12-team points league, 21-man roster, so 252 players rostered. It's about the shallowest league I play in, so keep that in mind. But I had a situation where I wanted to add somebody off waivers, and I'm like, okay, who's the low guy to drop here? And Castillo... Come on, you probably have Zach Prezak on that team. No, I don't. <laughs> um, now, I ultimately decided not to do it. I talked myself out of it, but that was the first time my mind went to that place. Could I honestly consider dropping Castillo? Part, really, the fact is rostership was over 90%. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to drop him before anyone else has. That's just crazy. That's what I ended up uh, putting in a drop for Reese Hoskins instead, which you know tells you how shallow the league is that Hoskins is somebody I could consider dropping. Um. But yeah, I'm I'm worried because like nothing seems right for Castillo at this point. I mean, you could say he got his velocity back, which you know it was down, it was way down the first start and then still down several starts after that. It's mostly come back, but the effectiveness has only gotten worse since it's come back. And in the past, when he struggled, he would he was getting hit hard, but he was still missing a ton of bats. He has a combined 16 whiffs. In his past three starts, he's never had a stretch like that. Like the changeup, he just doesn't have it this year. And as we're seeing, there's not much there when he doesn't have the changeup. Um, now, I mean, it could be the sort of thing where he regains the feel for it and he's back in his very next start and never looks back. But if he doesn't, like there's clearly not enough there for him to make do without it. So... So I'm worried, and you know, I, I hate in those shallower leagues, especially to just plop him on my bench and wait who knows how long for him to have that epiphany where he regains the feel. I do still think it's too early, but it's becoming it's it's rapidly becoming not too early anymore. We're six weeks in approximately, and that's the point when I said you, you gotta that's the point when I've been saying all along you gotta start making some tough decisions on these slow starters. I don't think we're there with Castillo yet, but Certainly by the end of May, he needs to have this. He, he needs to be, he needs to show signs that he's getting on track. We Sammy have Luis Castillo. I would love to plop him on my bench. <laughs> would be thrilled. We have to bench him in Coors Field this week, right? Oh, for sure. sure. Yeah. Bench I, him I, anyway. think I, I wouldn't start him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in terms of just classic buy low, sell high situations, I'm going to give you three pitcher names. You tell me whether or not you would actually trade them away for Luis Castillo right now. John Means. Yes. You would trade him for Luis Castillo? No. Yes. no. Would you... This trade actually happened in the For the People podcast league over the weekend. Would you yeah, trade they, Carlos Rodon for Luis Castillo? The yes. guy asked me about it right before he made the trade, and I said, I said, trade Luis Castillo for Carlos Rodon. I don't think I would do it. No uh, way. <laughs> would you trade... Who was the other one? Kevin Gosman. Would you trade Kevin Gosman to get Luis Castillo right now? I would rather have Gosman's, so the answer is no. You wouldn't do it. No, but Chris just said no. No, I would not trade <laughs> Luis Castillo to get Kevin Gosman. Sorry. You would rather have Luis Castillo than Kevin Gosman. I would yeah. rather have Kevin Gosman than Luis Castillo. I I guess nope. I'm moving Luis Castillo out of my top 30, 35 at starting pitcher. Luis Castillo's SP15 for me. Okay. 
I will. And I did move him down to be dropping him a, a little bit further than that as well. Let's move a little bit quicker with D so we can get to uh, a lot of other stuff. Kyle Hendricks was up against the Pirates on Sunday. He allowed six runs for those earned over five innings pitched. He has a 6.23 ERA. Scott, what is your worryometer on Kyle Hendricks, who looked like he was back after his last start against the Dodgers? It was a great start. Uh, and then he puts up this clunker against the Pirates of all teams. Worryometer, and would you start him this week at Detroit? It's a four. I see more signs of true Kyle Hendricks in there, but yeah, I hate that there's such a good matchup coming up. I think uh, I think you have to bench him. Because, okay. I mean, it just, just happened against the Pirates, so. Yeah, yeah that's fair. I mean, the, t- the Tigers are 25th in weighted on base average against right-handed pitching, and the... They're... they're I, Last I checked, they were by far the last in OPS. So I don't know. Maybe you miss out on a good start, but yeah, uh, I hate decisions like that. Yeah, I, I still even more with Kyle Hendricks and Luis Castillo. There's just really nothing under the hood that kind of points to I, he's allowing harder contact this year, and usually he's great at suppressing that. But right, I, I think yeah. it's I think it's a situation with Hendricks where his he, it relies on his command being so fine. And yeah. it just hasn't been this year. Chris, let's talk about Charlie Morton. He was at the he was at home against the Phillies on Friday. He only recorded two outs. He allowed six runs, zero earned, by the way. Uh, there was a strikeout pass ball that gave the Phillies an extra out. Uh, Charlie Morton currently has a 4.98 ERA, but a 3.60 XFIP and a 50% ground ball rate, his highest since 2017. Worryometer on Charlie Morton. I mean, he's coming off a start with a zero ERA. What's to worry about? Um, I'm two. People I would, would probably be on Friday saying he's broken. Charlie Moore. Yeah, I know. I, I had the same thing. And like, I, I get it, guys. Like, you're reactionary. It's okay. Sometimes you have to be while you're playing. I'm not, I'm not saying that that like as a just across the board insult. Like sometimes you have to be when you're playing fantasy baseball. And one of my biggest flaws as a player, I would think, um, and you're seeing it in this section is that I'm not reactionary at all. I, I tend to give guys a lot of a long rope and sometimes that's enough rope to string me up with. But in Charlie Morton's case, I'm seeing a lot of positives. Um, you know, his chase rate is low, uh, lower than it ever has been, but he's actually getting more whiffs than he was last season. And it's the second highest whiff rate of his career. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle and makes me think that the stuff's pretty good right now. The stuff is certainly better than we were worried it might be. So I'm I'm not particularly concerned. I think he's going to, you know, be a mid to high ERA, three ERA guy with a, a lot of strikeouts. That's a, that's a good pitcher. You- I, I, Go I, I agree that he's the least concerning of the three um, Castillo Hendricks. I'd, I'd put Morton as the least concerning. He was probably he the least valuable going in too, yeah. so that's something to keep in mind. He um, is the lowest lowest ranked for me of the right. three, but still, yeah, right. Um, I'll say three on my worryometer. Mm-hmm. Would you trade Zach Plesac for Morton if you could? No, uh, I would rather have Morton. Yeah, I, I would rather have Morton as well. Uh, how about Blake Snell? He was at the Giants this weekend, four and two thirds, only one hit, but six walks, four earned runs. The walks per nine up to a very Formerly Robbie Ray, not Robbie Ray this year. Robbie Ray esque six point two walks per nine for Blake Snell. The ERA is at four point one five. The WHIP is at one point four eight. Scott, your worryometer on Snell. So his swinging strike rate is way down from the past couple of years. Still good, but you know he used to be one of the very best at that. And his walk rate is just awful. And he's still gone since when? How long since having a six inning start? July 17th, 2019, I believe. Gosh. I saw somebody tweet that. It's just like if he's going to hurt your whip and he's going to make it hard to get a win and he's not going to be like otherworldly with the strikeouts, It's. I, I think he's less than an automatic start. So he's somebody I moved behind John Means too, or at least I'm going to, in addition to Castillo. So I will say my worry element around Snell is... Probably like a four, probably there with Hendricks. 
It's been since July 21st, 2019, oh, that Blake Snell has not completed six innings in a start. Chris, let's talk about our boy, Joe Musgrove. He was at the Giants this weekend, five innings, four runs, still had seven strikeouts. He has a 6.92 ERA over his last three starts. The Worryometer on Big Joe. Uh, I mean, yeah, J Joe Musgrove's not the best pitcher in baseball. He's not one of the 10 best pitchers in baseball. So if you thought he was that, you should be pretty worried. But I'm I'm not worried relative to where he was preseason. He is still he has still moved up. I'm not really particularly looking to move him down. Um point seven. All point right. four. Let's uh -huh. let's wrap up with Dylan Bundy, Scott. We've talked about him. We we're talking a little bit before the podcast started and it's kind of just having a weird season. Tough matchup this weekend against the Dodgers. Three and a third, six earned. His ERA now up to 5.03. What do you do you see anything? What, what's what's going on with Dylan Bunny, the worryometer there? Yeah, so he was somebody who I was surprised to see after this last start. His ERA is over five because he's my my impression as somebody who has a lot of Dylan Bundy is like quality start machine. Five out of his seven starts have been quality starts. Um, a lot of the underlying numbers look even better than last year. His XFIP 359, that's lower than it was last year. And that's certainly a fine XFIP. So um, my worryometer on Bundy is probably like a two just because he's Dylan Bundy. So there's some inherent worry baked in there, but I don't think he's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with him necessarily i think he's had some bad luck um obviously his last start the fact he has no wins despite having quality start that's the <laughs> ultimate bad luck right uh but yeah i think i think his era is going to go down from here i actually like don't even i don't even see what's gone wrong like there's some pitchers where you can say like well i don't think they've done anything wrong but this thing and has gone wrong like his WOBA against on every pitch is 338 or below and league average is about 320. So, you know, his fastball has been getting hit harder than you'd want, but it's not like most fastballs you usually seen like the 380 range. Um, I would guess it's just been like Scott said, like his strand rate is really low, 60%. And it's been like clustered among a couple of starts that have gone really wrong. So I would guess it's mostly just like, He's had like six bad innings across the the whole season is what my guess would be. But and he hasn't had like, like a, a one or two hitter to make up for it on the other end, the way like a Zach Wheeler has, you know? Yeah. yeah. I would yeah. think if I had to guess, that would probably be, I, I would guess he's just had really bad cluster luck, I think is what they call it. <laughs> it's a thing. Is that, is that what they call it? I think so. Yeah. It sounds yeah. like you made that up. <laughs> I think it's a, I think baseball perspectives is written about. Yeah. Yeah. Cluster okay. luck is a thing. It just, it talks about how often your, your hits come close together relative okay. to what you would norm, what you would typically expect from a normal distribution. So among these pitchers that we just talked about, Castillo, Hendricks, Morton, Blake Snell, Joe Musgrove, and Dylan Bundy. Who are you most likely to try and buy low on? The one that you have the most confidence in bouncing back? Probably Bundy. Castillo. Fair enough. We're going to hit a quick break, but when we return, we're going to talk about some waiver wire hitters from this weekend. We'll do it next on Fantasy Baseball Today. So let's take a look at some of those waiver wire hitters and talk about Andrew Vaughn, who... Is batting 294 over his last 15 games, but still does not have a home run. And, you know, that's not very exciting, obviously. He's 63% rostered, but he is playing more and he's hitting pretty well. Uh, Jorge Polanco, someone else as well. He's 60% rostered. He has five hits over his last two games. The underlying numbers look pretty good there for Jorge Polanco. Adolis Garcia, three more hits, including his ninth home run and five more RBI on Sunday. He's batting 297 with a 943 OPS. 63% rostered. The, only, the other one I'll throw in here, Andrew McCutcheon, over his last seven games, he's batting 385 with three home runs. He is 59% rostered. Who would who are you guys most interested in between Vaughn, Polanco, Adolis Garcia, and Andrew McCutcheon? Well, I'm pretty interested in... I mean, Vaughn, obviously, for the upside, but in terms of how usable they are right now, I mean... An, 
Adolis Garcia in uh in 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 categories leagues. Uh he he looks like he's going to be a useful source of power, particularly in like a five outfielder league where you know you don't need everybody to be a a total stat line filler. I, I think Garcia is pretty one dimensional. He might chip in the occasional steal and he'll have some cold stretches, but I think uh I think the power power is gonna be pretty pretty good. Pretty good when all's said and done. I do really like McCutcheon's matchups for him this week though, and he's on a nice run here. So if you need you know, if you need a if you need a sleeper pickup, and obviously somebody who's re- trending the right direction, then McCutcheon's pretty interesting too. Chris, if you need a middle infielder, which Rojas do you like more, Miguel or Josh? Miguel has 11 hits over his last six games. He's batting 286 with an 825 OPS overall. Josh Rojas batting 400 with four home runs over his last 15 games. Which one do you like more? I think it's definitely Josh Rojas, Miguel Rojas. I mean, sort of quietly is hitting 288 over the last three seasons. Um, He has just been a really solid source of batting average, but he has 11 homers and 17 stolen bases in 202 games over those two over, over those three seasons. So um, he's really not doing much for fantasy because like per 162 game average is nine homers, 14 steals and 139 combined runs in RBI. I, I he's fine. Like he's always going to be like a middle infielder. You can pick up at any time in any league and use him for a while. But Josh Rojas has a much more interesting fantasy uh, profile. More power, more speed. Batting average probably going to be, you know, 60 points lower maybe, but um, definitely Josh Rojas. Yeah, I think it's a floor versus upside comparison. Uh, But yeah, Josh Rojas is pretty interesting and he's playing well. He's someone we liked. He he. He was flashing in, in spring training, got off to a really slow start, but now he's coming along. I think he was betting cleanup for the Diamondbacks on Sunday, so they're just throwing him right there in the middle of the lineup. How about in deeper leagues? A few names that stood out to me from the weekend. Harrison Bader has seven hits over his last seven games, including three home runs. Statcast numbers quietly very good for Harrison Bader. 282 XBA, 584 X slug, 93rd percentile in sprint speed. A few other names here. Robbie Grossman over his last 15 games. 250 batting average, but a 409 OBP, two home runs, and five steals during that span. Nico Goodrum, last two weeks, 278 batting average, three homers, four steals, and Hunter Renfro heating up 10 hits over his last eight games with three home runs. So between Bader, Grossman, Goodrum, and Renfro, who do you like most? Well, Bader, I I compared him to Kevin Kiermeyer about a week ago, and apparently he's mad at me. His strikeout rate is way down. That has only 37 plate appearances, but yeah, it's kind of interesting. He's uh, playing every day. Yeah, that too. You know, Renfro, when he gets hot, he can hit a lot of home runs in a short period of time, and when he's not hot, you'll regret that you ever picked him up. So, it, I don't know. I, I don't feel I don't love any of them to be honest. I mean, Goodrum, his numbers look great, but he's striking out 40% of the time. So obviously that's not gonna last. You know, if I was going less than 10% rostered, I think I'd take a flyer on Tyrone Taylor myself, who continues to get at bats in the Brewers outfield with Christian Yelich out. And I there's a power speed combo there that's pretty enticing. He hasn't been striking out all that much. He got some some buzz in Brewers circles this spring. So he's he's somebody I was adding in a couple 15-team leagues where I needed outfield help, Tyrone Taylor. All righty, yeah. Tyrone Taylor, throw him in that mix with a few other names there. Again, Harrison Bader, Grossman. Uh, I, Nico I will say Hunter Grossman, Rick. if you're in any kind of OVP league with five outfielders, I think he's must roster. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, if he hits 250, he's probably going to be a top... 50 ish outfielder because he's hitting high in the lineup. He's running um, and he's going to score runs. So he's pretty unsexy, but yeah. I think he could be like outfield Colton Wong. I don't know. That, that no, may not seem like good. the highest I, compliment, but you know, he already like has Wong. seven steals this year. Which yeah. Is, yeah. That's a big total. So yeah, I probably should have not just glossed over Grossman. Let's answer a few trade questions, a few potential candidates. Who would you guys rather buy low on right now? Paul Goldschmidt and Anthony Rizzo. 
eerily similar. Goldschmidt's batting 246 with a 271 XBA. Anthony Rizzo's batting 229 with a 271 XBA. So the exact same number. Who would you guys rather buy low on right now if you could? Goldschmidt. Definitely Goldschmidt in categories. I think I'd go Rizzo in points, though. Goldschmidt oh, not I... walking as much. No, the plate discipline is kind of weird for yeah. Goldschmidt so far. This oh, game. yeah. He's... Wow. And Rizzo's just always so good with the strikeout to walk ratio. Yeah. 26% strikeout rate for Goldschmidt would be his highest ever in a full season. Yep. Um, obviously, it's not and... a full season, so things could change, but. <laughs> His lowest six, walk rate ever, too. Yeah, six percent walk rate too. Um, yeah, I think I think I would actually take Anthony Rizzo in, in both formats, but I mean they are pretty close players. It was I just thought it was so interesting that they like their underlying numbers were, were this close. How about some sell high candidates? Sell high or no thanks guy. Aaron Spale <laughs> at the Reds mentioned his name already a few times in this podcast. Seven innings of one run ball, two point nine one ERA on the season, but that comes with a four point two one XFIP. And a 3.59 expected ERA. Would you try and sell high on Aaron Savali right now if you could? I don't think he's as good as he's been so far. So, yes. But as always, I want to stress that the most important word in the phrase sell high is high. So, you got to get something good for him to make it worth it. Would you trade him for one of the first basemen we just talked about? Probably not. Unless I was starting a real stinker at first base. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a lot of teams. Scott and I have weird teams so far. His offenses are carrying him, whereas I've got a lot of teams with more pitching than I than I need. What um, is the so world that we're in? And I, I have, like I said, Savali and Plezak are the Spider-Man meme. I've got them 45 and 44. So, you know, I, I like... I would look to move either of them for Chris Paddock. I think I'd rather take that gamble on the upside there. Um, even though he was, you know, you know, kind of mad again today. I'm not sure. Why do you get pulled early today? It was only like 53 pitches. Was it just coming back from the IL? Yeah, I think it was just his first game back. I mean, yeah. They did the same thing with Denelson Lamed as well. So yeah. it seems like they're just playing it safe, safe with these guys. Uh, would you trade Savale for, I might have asked this already, for Charlie Morton? I think I said it. Oh, yeah. I'd rather have Morton exactly. than Savale and please, Zach. Yeah, I would agree with that. Goes as well. saying. How about uh, Zach Eflin? We have not talked about Zach Eflin. I don't I don't think all season, but yeah. he's been great. Six and two thirds, two earned with eight strikeouts at the Braves this weekend. He has gone six plus innings in all seven of his starts. He's got a 3.38 ERA. Can he keep it up? Sell high or no thanks guy. Zach Eflin. He's a weird pitcher. He's weird, kind of like Savale is weird. I think, I think, I think that's maybe roughly what he is. Um, he's not walking anybody. He has forty-two strikeouts to three walks this season. Yeah, he is. He's kind of doing like a twenty-twenty Zach Plezak uh, impersonation right now, um, which means he's a lot like Aaron Savale. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, he like he's uh, he's actually always been someone who does a good job of re- of s- suppressing hard contact. He's got a 45, 44.5% hard hit rate. Granted, that is, you know, hard hit rate is up league wide. So you have to adjust for that. But still, it's by far the highest, even when you do that adjustment. Um, but, you know, we're talking about a guy who's been pretty solid for three years running now. I mean, if this counting year three, mm-hmm. I've got him 51 and I want to move him up, but I don't know where and I don't know how. Uh, but, He's good. I feel really confident in Zach Eflin right now. The problem with selling high on Eflin is like Savale is like one of the pit, like is just like a industry darling for some reason. I've never really understood why everybody likes him so much, but he gets buzzed about all the time. And so I, I think it's easier for people to think they're getting something they're not with him. When Eflin, you might have a harder time getting the high return you're looking for. But I do think. He's probably not quite as good as he's been so far. So take that for what it's worth. I'm going to lump these three starting pitchers together that all had great outings over the weekend. Jose Urquidy, the ERA is now 3.51. He has three straight quality starts. Carlos Rodon was at the Kansas City Royals. Six shutout. The ERA is 0.58 for Carlos Rodon. We've mentioned him as a, as a sell high. 
maybe we want to rescind that. And then Sean Manaya, he took a no-hitter into the eighth inning against the Tampa Bay Rays, seven and one-third with 10 strikeouts. 3.07 is the ERA for Sean Manaya. Urquidy, Rodon, Manaya. do you want to sell high on any of these? Of all the pitchers in this whole segment, the, the one I have the least confidence in is Urquidy. He has a 488 X. <laughs> Sorry, he's not striking out anybody. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how he's getting it done. High fly ball rate, uh, walk rate's good, I guess. But yeah, no, I, I don't have much confidence in him at all. Like Rodon, there's still a case to for selling high on Rodon, but it's a, it's a season. It's, it's when you're looking at the full length of the season. It's not he's going to go bad in his next start. You know, that's that's not what I'm worried about with Rodon. It's that this is his first full year back from Tommy John and. Can he reasonably be asked to to work this hard all season long? I, I would say no. I would say that's bad for his career if he does that. So um, that that's what I'm worried about with him and why I might call him a sell high. So you, you just got to understand the context of that. Do you guys think you could get anything for Patrick Corbin right now? He now has three quality starts in his last four. He has a 3.52 ERA during that span. I think he should try it because... He is teetering on the edge of disaster. <laughs> yeah. Dur- during that four star stretch with the 3.52 ERA, he's got a 6.19 FIP and a 4.49 X FIP. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I really, I really struggling with like the 30 to 45 range at starting pitcher. And man, it's not in a bad way. This is yeah. unrelated to Patrick Corbin, who is not in that range whatsoever he's not inside my top 60 anymore but it's like i've got rodon 38 gosman 37 tyler malley 36 and we can quibble about the order of those guys and like i would love to move them all up but then it's like i've got bundy 33 arias 32 freed gray pablo lopez you know like pitching's kind of good right now i feel like there's like 45 ish pitchers who i feel Maybe even like 50. It's weird. And I would love to move like John Means to 40 seems stupid with how well he's pitching right now. But I don't, I would not rather have him than Julio Arias. Mm-hmm. So it's Separate like, I separate you from me, pal. Yeah, well, yeah, you're the John Means <laughs> guy. You've got your brand. We've all got to sell. You know, I get it. <laughs> uh, but like, or even like Trevor Rogers is 34. I would rather have Trevor Rogers than John Means. That's not a knock against John Means. I'm just really struggling with this range because I'm I'm questioning just how dominant Rodgers is going to be now because he seems to have lost confidence in the slider and the whiffs haven't been there the past three starts and he's usually only going five innings. I'm not saying like I'm no longer excited. I don't want him anymore. Whatever. I just I just kind of wonder what's going on with him. Well, you know what? I'm questioning how dominant John Means is going to be. Oh, right. oh, someone who, enough. someone who might be knocking on the door of that top 50 starting pitchers is Jamison Tyone, who up against the Nationals this weekend, six and a third, three earned, five strikeouts. It was his first quality start of the season. He got his pitch count all the way up to 99. That hadn't been above 82 pitches in any start this year. So Jamison Tyone has a 5.02 ERA, but he has a 3.87 XFIP and a 3.16 expected ERA. I don't think it's a buy high. I think it's just a buy Jamison Tyone before people realize that he's about to be maybe not awesome, but really good. Yeah, he's trending the right way for sure. It's yep. it's more gradual process than maybe a lot of people wanted it to be, but things are looking up. A few waiver wire starting pitchers I wanted to mention as well. Zach Davies who pitched seven shutout with uh, only one strikeout against the Pirates. Rich Hill, his last three starts, he's allowed two earned runs, over 15 innings pitched. Adrian Hauser, six innings, two runs, 10 strikeouts against the Marlins this weekend. Tyler Anderson just continues to get it done. Eight innings, six strikeouts against the Cubs, 29% rostered, three earned runs or less in all seven of Tyler Anderson's starts. And then Dane Dunning, which I also found this interesting. Five innings, two runs, 10 strikeouts. 17 swinging strikes on 89 pitches. He threw his slider 37% of the time in the start, which was by far the most all season. And like Tyone, they actually let Dunning throw 
89 pitches, which was the, se- the season high. He hadn't been above 76 pitches all season long. So between yeah. Evie's Hill, Hauser, Anderson, Tyler Anderson, and Dane Dunning, who would be your favorite to add from that group? If I Prop- trust it. If I trusted Dane Dunning could get, uh, you know, a, a pretty healthy workload, like average even five and a half innings per start. Um, I think like he's got a 390 ERA and a 320 FIP in, you know, only 13 starts, 62 innings, but he's been really solid so far in his major league career. It's just, I don't think the workload will be there. I, I think Hauser is probably my favorite of this group, but. I'm starting to talk myself into Tyler Anderson a bit. It's not a great group. Um, Dunning would probably be my favorite too. Like when he throws the, the slider has been a good swing and miss pitch for him from the beginning. He threw it twice as often as usual in this star. Like you said, Frank, but like, I just wish, I don't know, maybe there's a reason why he doesn't throw it more normally. Um, but yeah, there's some consistency issues there. I worry about, Hauser is has been the best ground ball pitcher among qualifiers this year ahead of Keiko and our guy Wade Miley. Uh, the fact he got 22 swinging, 17 swinging, sorry, 20, 17 swinging strikes, strikes in this 10 strikeout start over the weekend. Total outlier. He had a 5.6 swinging percent, swinging strike percent. 5.6% swinging strike rate. What's happening to my brain? Uh, going into that start, which is just unthinkably bad. So um, really, really dependent on the ground balls. And I think this was only his second six-inning start, too. So he's he's kind of Miley-like, but like I think I want him even less than Miley. Who was that? Sorry. Adrian Hauser. Hauser. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I like Dunning the most of this group. I'd probably rank the, the, my favorite three, Dunning, Tyler Anderson, and Adrian Hauser in that order. Uh, what else do we got here? The call to the pen from the weekend. Some bullpen updates. Craig Kimbrell was not used on Friday. He was unavailable. Ryan Tapera and Rex Brothers tag team the save then. Kimbrell was back on Saturday for his sixth save. Kendall Graveman picked up a save for the Mariners on Friday. Rafael Montero was not used. For the Giants on Friday, Tyler Rogers in the eighth. Jake McGee still used in the ninth. He picked up his eighth save of the season. Brad Hand took his first blown save of the season, and then he was either pitching in a tie game on Sunday. Did he blow another save on? No, yeah, it was a tie game. Two to two in the ninth, and he gave up a run to the Yankees. So uh, two Loss it, uh, one loss and one blown save for Brad Hand over the weekend. Alex Ray has finally allowed his first run of the season, but did get his 10th save on Saturday. Ryan Helsley came in for the Cardinals on Sunday with Alex Reyes unavailable, picked up the save. Then on Saturday for Oakland, Jake Diekman was used in the eighth. Lou Trevino was used in the ninth, picked up his sixth save. Hector Neris blew a save over the season, uh, over the weekend as well. Blake Trinan got a save for the Dodgers on Saturday. And anything else noteworthy here? Uh, for Tampa Bay on Sunday, Jeffrey Springs was used in the fifth. Andrew Kittredge recorded five outs for his second save. So You love the race. What? You love the race. Hopefully, oh, Diego Castillo's back soon. I think you, you had a note about that earlier, right? Yes, please. Yeah, let's just get him back. I do want to point out, this may be you know, fun with arbitrary endpoints, but Alex Reyes, over his last six appearances, has 10 strikeouts and in 7.2 innings with only three walks. Uh, that was obviously a significant issue for him early in the season. He had nine walk, nine strikeouts to 10 walks uh, in his first 10 appearances. So maybe he's starting to figure it out. Maybe, um, you know, there, there was a lot of, oh, sell high on Alex Reyes. I had a lot of that in my mentions. You know, he was the biggest sell high candidate in baseball. I was never all that worried because they really do seem to trust him throughout all of that. He's been really hard to hit, which helps. And, um, you know, if he's knocking the rust off and he's starting to figure it out, I think he could just run away with, you know, being a, a high end closer moving forward. Yeah. And Jordan Hicks is on the IL for at least the next month. So yep. that was probably the main competition. Uh, Gallegos has been a little bit inconsistent this year. And it seems like maybe Ryan Helsley is even the next man up behind Alex Reyes if something were to happen there. But Reyes has been fantastic. To stream or not to stream for Monday, choose three of these. Obviously, if Kyle Gibson or Alex Wood are available, I 
they are far and away the best starting pitchers uh, of this group, but they are rostered in over 80% of CBS League, so I didn't include them. Jeff Hoffman at the Pirates. Mitch Keller versus the Reds. Martin Perez at the Orioles. Luis Garcia versus the Angels. And Luke Weaver versus the Marlins. Uh, I think it's Luis Garcia because he's RP eligible. Um, so yeah. if that matter if that matters for a point three of this group too. Mitch Keller, honestly, I wish he'd just been awful this season, but he's actually basically alternated dreadful starts with really, really good ones. And yep. based on the pattern, he's got a dreadful start coming up. I don't actually believe that that is predictive or relevant moving forward, but I don't think you can trust him. I did like, I thought about dropping him in so many leagues because I have Mitch Keller in so many leagues for some reason. Uh, and that's why I said I wish he'd just been terrible so I could have dropped him this week because I really need the roster spot, but he's just just doing enough. Keep I think me. you could probably drop him, Chris. I didn't, but he, yes, I probably no, I probably could. Nobody would pick him up. But then if he goes out tomorrow and throws six innings with eight strikeouts and one walk, I'm gonna feel like a real dummy. And then when he gets shelled in his next start. Did you give three pitchers you like? <laughs> I knew I you like was, uh, uh, Garcia, Weaver, and then Keller. Okay. Garcia, the only one I'm going to give you is actually one Chris didn't give you, Martin Perez at Baltimore. I I, I refuse to pick a third. It's just too bad. <laughs> That's perfectly fine. Uh, for Tuesday, Logan Webb versus the Texas Rangers, Albert Alzali at Cleveland, JT Brubaker versus the Reds, Robbie Ray at the Braves, Kwang Hyun Kim at the Brewers, and Yusei Kikuchi at the Dodgers. Ray at the Braves. I, I like this group a lot more. I think yes. I think you have to start Robbie Ray no matter who he's facing, pretty much. Um famous Ad last words. Adbert Alzali. <laughs> Adbert Alzali at Cleveland. I like that. And uh if it wasn't the Dodgers, it was anybody but the Dodgers. Yeah, exactly. I Kwang Hyun Kim at Milwaukee. I'll go with him third. I think that's probably the right choice. All righty. For Scott and Chris, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.